coming in uh, to the garage on Bible study on Wednesday. We sure appreciate your hungering after the word. What did God say in Isaiah 66? He said, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. And he says, what house will you build me? You know, and he's referring to God is too big to dwell just in houses. Amen. He says, but to whom will I look? I will look to the man of a contrite spirit and those that tremble at my word. And so I believe, my pastor always told us, if you lose your hunger to study the word, to get into the word of God, and you're just kind of floating around, this is the time of sifting. And God is sifting the serious from the goats, the, the sheep from the goats. So I'm going to throw this out to you. I know that that's an end time, what we call a parable uh, of the kingdom. But the sheep from the goats, just think about it. Sheep do better in gatherings. They do better when people are gathered in his name and, and uh, under the shepherd. And of course, there's always a few goats there. But goats, if you have a herd of goats, you know, other than feeding time, other than watering time and time in the, in the uh, sheep stall, goats wander around a lot. And so what God is doing and what my pastor taught us is that if you're going to be serious with God, it has to be a seriousness with your thoughts and actions to follow through in the word. So if you want revival in your life, you must put God in his word first place. And so what, what our pastor taught us is if you're not, when the, when the word is being taught, you're not lined up to receive as much from the word as you can, you're just going to kind of be there. But it's those that study to show their self approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing what, folks? Yeah, the word of truth. God wants us to know enough to be able to tell good teaching from bad teaching. Can you say amen? And you know, the devil always tries to counterfeit the real, doesn't he? But nobody counterfeits the $3 bill. And many Christians today, I'm just going to say this before we go on. And many Christians today are teaching things they shouldn't because they don't know enough about it. And when you do that, remember, teachers, according to James, we receive a stricter judgment, don't we, honey? Because we are teaching people and educating people, supposedly, hopefully, with wisdom and truth. Amen. And all of us, and especially teachers, must give an account of every idle word that is spoken. And we will. Can you say amen? So as a teacher, you have to have that sobering desire to want to get it right. Can you say amen? And the best way, if you're desiring, you feel God wants you to teach some, then just ask him every day, God, make sure I'm not teaching error. Make sure I'm not teaching goofy stuff. Kind of keep me on track, God. Thank you, right? And he does. That's the exciting thing about it. All right, would you open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Now, the Bible teaches us that we have an enemy, and he does not like the fact that we're made in God's image. That we're following God's will. That you and I exist right in the face of him. That, and we testify that God is alive and well in our hearts. Can you say amen? All right. So if God is alive and well in our hearts, Satan really doesn't like it. So he's going to try to tempt us. He's going to try to do things that will try to hinder us. Or give us an, another alternative or an excuse not to fulfill the will of God for our life. Everyone say, not me. Not me. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, that means in the natural man, in the physical Adam flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, we don't fight punching the devil with fists and kicks and karate chops. How many know that our battle is not against flesh and blood? We do not war according to the flesh. For our weapons of the warfare that we war in are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Strongholds. 
Then it tells us what they are. Look at verse 5. Casting down what? Imaginations. Or if you have a modern translation, arguments. Reasonings. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Temptation comes just that way. Hello. In the beginning, in the garden, when God said, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat of, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat thereof, for in the moment that you eat it, you shall die. Right? And so we know Snaggletooth, in chapter 3 of Genesis, comes in, he was more subtle, more crafty than all the other creatures. Hello? And we also note that he's not crawling on his belly, and he's not crawling on four legs. He's walking in on two. Just a little note there. So he's kind of a humanoid type, a reptilian type, weird looking creature. That's Lucifer. Very beautiful. A plume serpent. Uh, if you've ever seen a plume serpent, they're one of the most gorgeous. Gorgeous enough for a little kid to put their hand down there just to get bit. And so Satan is gorgeous, is marvelous, full of wisdom, but corrupted to the core. He crawls in there and he starts tempting Adam and Eve. Right? And so who does he come to first? He comes to the weakest vessel. Who's the weakest vessel, Adam or Eve? Eve, can anybody tell me real quickly why she seems to be the weakest? The Bible does declare it, that Adam had a direct relationship with God, but Eve had an indirect relationship through her husband with God. It's not a good thing to do. You have a personal relationship with God. So when Satan came, he came to the one that didn't have so much information. Okay? Now he also deceived Adam. Well, how so? Because Adam took his eyes off of his creator and put his eyes on the creation God made from him. Eve. Yeah, baby. So temptation sometimes appeals to the eyes and draws our attention away from God. And so we see a great scenario of Satan coming in at the right time when Adam's preoccupied, he's looking at us, the creation more than God and Eve is not full of information and Satan comes to her. Now when he suggests some things, where was Adam? Standing right there, Adam should have said, no, I bind you, get out of here. You know, I take authority over you, don't you ever come into this garden again. And that would have been it. But he didn't do it. So sometimes not doing what is right can be a sin. For he that knows to do it, do good, and doesn't do it, to them it is sin. And so temptation, we know the tempter came in and he worked on Eve and Adam, and they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One more thing. The knowledge of good and evil. Didn't Adam and Eve know divine good? But they, but, so what's this good and evil? You know, I told you the other day. The good and evil is physical, natural good and evil, not divine evil. Not, excuse me, not divine good. It's human good and human evil. Hello. So the moment they ate of it, they saw how to be humanly good without God, and they saw that without God, they can become humanly evil. Hello. Check it out for yourself. They already knew God, didn't they? They already knew good. Something different. Something different. What did God warn the Israelites? He says, look, you're going to get pretty used to eating from places that you, you didn't grow your own food and living in homes you didn't build and you're going to be having profit that you didn't work really for and those blessings come. You be careful that you don't forget the Lord thy God that has brought you out of bondage. How often, as, as Christians, often we forget some of the things. Now remember, the enemy's job 
is to convince us of something alternatively correct other than God or to something to take the place of God in our hearts. Okay, so we see the temptation in the beginning. All right, you with me? For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are what kind? They're spiritual. Can you say amen? Now drop down to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It's listed in your notes. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Listen to this. But remember the... It said... But remember this, the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new. Let me say it again. This is a different translation, but it says, but remember that the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and are different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you. And no temptation is, is uh, irresistible. You can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. For he has promised, his, uh, promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power and so that you can bear up patiently against it. So let me put it more in uh, King James terms. But remember, no temptation befalls a man, but what is common to man. So the, the way to understand that is, what is temptation for, let, let's say, John Smith, would be different than what's the temptation for Billy Joe Bob. You follow what I'm saying? Because remember, when we're born under sin, in the sin market, our spirit and our soul and our body Satan begins to immediately work on us and place strongholds in our imagination. I call them trip points or trip switches. So you're going along and all of a sudden a deja vu trip switch goes and suddenly you start having those old emotions and those old things and you're beginning to get a little bit of a war going on in your mind. That's a stronghold. And see, that's what Satan uses many times is he, those strongholds. So he might even use somebody else to mention something. And suddenly you get that mad at that person because they've mentioned something that's a stronghold and it irritates you. So now you're mad at them and you forget the one who, who, who set you up. Someone say, oh me. We need to be wise as serpents and... Amen. So basically, no temptation has befallen us, but what is in common to us? For example, pornography. It's never been a problem with me. Okay? I don't lust after naked women or anything. Why? Because I've had plenty. <laughs> it's not a temptation. I'm an ex-drummer rock and roll person, for heaven's sakes. Now, but there are other things that could be temptating to me. Alcohol, I mean, I, I fought a big battle with alcohol, you know, a long time ago. My mother made moonshine. And so it's really hard to overcome certain habits. So Satan works on us when we're young to start laying these little strongholds in our soul. That's why it's so important to renew our mind on a daily basis because it acts like water washing and those old rivets and strongholds out of your old thinking so that even though you have memories of something bad, it no longer has the pain and the scars of it. No longer can Satan use it as a trip switch to, to tick you off. Moving right along. Now, we know this, but let's bring it up again. How does the enemy know when to attack Christians? Just let's not look at our notes. Let's just throw out some ideas. Come on, everybody. How does the enemy know when to attack a Christian? He knows when we're weak. How does he know when we're weak? He watches our countenance. Your face has a reflection on it. Remember what God said to Cain in, in Genesis chapter 4? Cain, why is your countenance fallen? So when we go in, this is why God started asking me to teach it, teach it, teach it. When you go in and meet with God, 
you get charged up and your countenance just becomes bright. We are what? A city set on a hill. We are the light of the world, right? Well, listen, you have something called carnal mud. Look at your neighbor and say, what? Carnal mud, what is that? That's your flesh. Sometimes will flip up on the outshining of Christ in your life. And all they can see is you and too much of it. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to pull us out of the spirit. Pull us out of being happy and excited. And looking for vision and getting things done. And just getting caught up with God. Being a good example before all God. And he gets us sidetracked. And then all of a sudden we start slinging mud. And the light begins to dim. Because we got too much of ourselves blocking it. See, so the fire or maybe... Help me, Lord. Amen. So he watches our countenance. Another thing is he listens to our words. Now, he's not always around, but if you listen to somebody, tone is very important. I remember watching the, the old movie Coneheads. You watch your tone. You watch your tone. When you're talking to me, you watch your tone. When we're talking... How are you talking? You're talking down to people? You're talking up to people? Are you talking about people? You know, he listens to our words because of the tone. People that are tremendously negative for a time, they drone. Uh, how you doing? Well, it's been really tough. Thank God. Gotcha, buddy. Takes a while for him to pick up on it, but he does. So why stay that way for any length of time? Huh? So not only he sees our countenance, he hears the tone of our words, he watches our actions. Because when you're excited, you can't sit still. You're just doing, 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 doing. And when you've got your mind on yourself, you're as slow as a slug. I mean, he watches the, the difference between the moods. So not whether or not that's it or not, but you can see the difference in... in the way in which we are playing out or walking out our relationship. And also besides that, he watches our actions. He can even smell us. I got some scriptures. I don't necessarily want to go there too much, but 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 17. I got it in the Living Bible, and I also got it in the New King James. It talks about that when we go places, we're supposed to diffuse the aroma of Christ to the, those that desire to be saved, aroma and fragrance of good, and those that are, are condemned, or the rock of stumbling, those that's an aroma of death. So somebody that's excited for Jesus is going to put people to the test. What do you mean? They're going to look at you and see that I either want what you have or I don't want anything what you have. They're either going to walk in the light or they're turn right around walk off into darkness. Doesn't mean anything. Why? We're a witness. We're a city set on a hill. We're a candle. We shouldn't be hidden. Well, I'm sorry that me loving Jesus offended you. I, I won't talk about it so much. Compromise. Somebody you know is, is, is in a bad state, speak up and share the word with them. Say amen. Why? Because Satan's messing with them. You want to be messed with? Say amen. <laughs> so let me just read 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 17, New King James. It says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ through us diffuses the fragrance or aroma of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to another the aroma of life leading to life. Who is sincere, uh, who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. But as of sincerity but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. In other words, we're going to speak about Christ. We know that the enemy's trying to get us off. I, I ask people, I says, now that you've accepted Jesus and you're thinking about maybe just doing your own thing again, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? What did Jesus say? Now, I'm, I'm, this is touchy, so I have to be careful. 
What did he say? He, he said, you're like dogs returning to your vomit. And pigs wallowing in the mire. Why? Because people, remember the Israelites? They got blessed with riches, their sandals, their clothes didn't wear out. They get under their first trial. First thing they say is, Moses wish we would be back into Egypt. You brought us out here to die. See, they were being tempted. Now, let me say something else to you before we really get into this. In the Old Testament, now listen carefully. In the Old Testament, God did not live in the believer, right? Jesus hadn't died, hadn't rose again. So tempting and testing was different in the Old Testament because God fit in there too. What do you mean? Not only is Satan the tempter in the Old Testament, but God is not a tempter. He's a, a prover. So in the Old Testament, he says, I led you all these years in the wilderness to test you to see where your mind and where your heart is. And they were born again. So God was testing them to see what choices they would make. Now, why is that different, Pastor Kerry, than the New Testament? What's different between an Old Testament believer and a New Testament believer? What do we have that they don't have? Jesus Christ in our heart. They didn't have that. So guess what? God is not our tempter. He already knows where you're at. He lives in your heart. So that's where the confusion comes in. They're looking at God proving and testing the Israelites because they weren't born again, because they were used oftentimes by the devil to go against the will of God. God tested them through the wilderness and proved either they were faithful or not. And when they all went through the wilderness, how many ended up, all those three million plus people, ended up actually going into the promised land? Look at my fingers. Two. I'd say they failed the test a bit, didn't you? And I'm not picking on them, please. They failed the test because they were serving God out of what can you give me instead of following God by faith, recognizing that the tempter tries to get people to turn from God to their selfishness. Remember what condition they were in when, when, when they came to Mount Sinai? What kind of condition was the Israelites in when they came to Mount Sinai? Do you remember? It wasn't very good. But they left Egypt in a good condition, didn't they? But by the time they reached Sinai, which isn't very far, where they received their first Pentecost, instead of receiving a blessing and anointing, they got the law. <laughs> they got it all right. Because they approached God in pride. What did Satan do? Why did he fall? He approached God in pride. Why does man fall? Why do Christians have a bad time? Because we approach God in? Why did Cain slew Abel? Because he approached God in? So these problems don't change. They follow all the way through the scripture and hopefully will gain the understanding of who the tempter is, who the prover is, who our accuser is, who is the strength of our life, and we'll be able to pan all that out clearly so that the Christian knows who the tempter is, why temptation comes, and what is the result or purpose of it. We should know those things, right? Are you still with me? All right, let's get into this. Why is there temptation? Anybody, let's make a stab. Why is there a temptation? Is God so insecure he has to let the devil tempt you? Satan tempts us because he doesn't want us to be a child good. Very good child of God, why else does he tempt us? Because we're a testimony of his defeat. He doesn't want us shining and smiling and being happy. Worst testimony you can give to the devil is you to dance and be happy and praise the Lord. Oh, shut it down. <laughs> be quiet. Be irritable. Get mad at a, a fellow Christian. You see what I'm saying? So, 
Why is there temptation? Well, we need to find out that to disqualify us from getting our inheritance. That would be one reason, right? By making us look foolish and giving up. Two, to draw us away from immediately knowing God and God causing us to grow up into him. How many know that, you know, when you're a young Christian, you do young things. You know, what did Paul say? He says, when I was a child, I did childish things, you know. I used to say it this way. When I was a child, I rode a tricycle. But when I became a man, you know, I drive a car. You know, so a lot of times God receives us for who we are. But he always is bringing us up into maturity to glorify his name, right? Well, Satan wants us somewhere along the line, get us discouraged or disqualify us from those things, right? Because he knows that it will win others to the Lord. Thirdly, to keep us from becoming who God designed us to be. If you were the best that you could be, you'd be winning souls left and right even by accident. Look at Billy Graham. Billy Graham could drop a pin and people would get saved because of the anointing and its faithfulness to God. Okay. I mean, just encouragement. But everybody's different. But you're a child of the Most High God. Let your face show it. Let your conversation be filled of it. And then people can go around and say, you're just full of it, aren't you? <laughs> you're full of it too. Glory to God. All right. Fourthly, keep us, keep us, our focus away, uh, away from God and on our problems. Remember, we're like a Polaroid camera. Whatever we focus on and click is going to produce on the screen of our life. If you're focused on all problems, then you're going to be problem conscious. If you're focused on everybody else's fault, you're going to be everybody else's fault conscious. Amen. Adam, it was the woman you gave me, God. All right, so you get it. Fifthly, our enemy can't read our minds. So what he does is he begins to throw suggestions and temptations our way to locate where we're at in Christ to get us to make wrong choices or some kind of facial reaction. You see, Christians, I believe we're to respond in situations, not react. I've seen people, something happen, they overreact, and then they go overdo it and cause even greater problems. That's not what God wants. He wants us to respond in situations, not to react to them. Say amen. Amen. All right, and then sixthly, because we have the nature of sin in our flesh, we become easy pickings. What are we to do with our body, folks? What does the Bible say? What are we to do with our body? We're to die daily. What else does it say? A few things. Perfect. It says to present your body a living sacrifice. So if you don't present yourself before God, your body's going to get out of line somewhere along the line that day. I watch people get filled with God. They'll come in and one little statement, and their whole life crashes in on them. Are they in the spirit or in the flesh? Do you suppose Satan's aware of that about them? And do you suppose he sets them up every time? Like for somebody, they'll get up there and preach a good sermon. And because they're that way and they've never dealt with it because God, Satan will throw something in the very next week, there'll be a basket case. And everything they preached will completely almost be erased because they're double-minded, standard people. Stop reacting, start responding. Start listening to God, focusing on him, and realize the tempter comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Don't listen to the tempter, because the tempter is not God in the New Testament. We're going to show you that in a minute. All right, so Jesus was tempted. Are we any better than him? Can you tell me, before we read this, what three areas Jesus was tempted in? I mean, just make a stab. Nobody, you know, he was tempted in. Huh? In the flesh. That's all temptations are of the flesh. In the spirit, there's no temptations. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? God lives in, in Christ. Christ is God. Only his flesh can be tempted. His spirit cannot. Same with you. 
Your flesh is tempted, but your spirit is not. So don't think that if you're walking in the, flesh, in the spirit, if you're tempted, you're not in the spirit, Baba. Whether you think you are or not, if you're easily irritated and tempted, you are not in the spirit. Nick, nick, not, not, stop and get that way. Can you say amen? Because you're actually scoring zip diddle. And you don't want the devil to be sitting around laughing at you. And others too if they catch you. Hello. I meddled and left. Let's go on. Amen. Gee, I wish so-and-so was here. They need to hear this. Don't do that. You need to hear this. Apply it to yourself. I apply it to me. Okay, Luke, look at this. Chapter 4. What's the story of the temptations of Christ? Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, sat down, didn't do anything. No. He, being filled with the Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the what? The Spirit into the wilderness. Folks, let me just tell you something. God is not always going to lead you into the candy store. If he's filled you with knowledge and wisdom, he's going to pers purposely put you places where they need to hear it. Hello? By the Spirit, led into the wilderness... Being, it didn't say to be, he says being tempted. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, now does Satan know he was the son of God? What's he doing? He's drawing Jesus into question. Getting him to doubt who he is. How many times has Satan tempted you to doubt who you are in Christ? Oh, no, you did it now. You committed the unpardonable sin. Don't you know his games by now? If not, come on in. Check us out. We'll train you. Ask lots of questions. I don't think enough Christians are asking their pastors and leaders the right questions. They're sitting around doodiddling. And arguing over 501c3s and who's right of God and who's not. I think you need to get in, study, and walk and sit at the feet of Jesus. Don't you think, amen? I do. All right, so let's go on and let's look at this. So he said to him, you be the son of God. Command these stones to become bread. You're hungry. Hey, make the stones bread. And Jesus answered and said, look what it says. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? By every... All right, guess what? You don't eat to live. You live to eat. No. <laughs> what you do is you live to walk with God. Eating is just a byproduct. How many know you can't put things in front of God? So he says, if you be the son of God, turn man these stones to be bread. He says, look it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showing him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and, and their glory, for this has been what? Who gave all those kingdoms to Satan? Adam. God didn't do it. Adam did. He stole them from Adam. So he's sitting right there. God and made Adam, made the devil, sitting there showing Jesus all the kingdoms that he took from Adam. Okay. Wow, this is amazing. Okay. Then he says, he says, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomsoever I wish. Therefore, if you will, worship me. You want to know why there's some countries that are really, really evil? They sold out to Satan. They made a pact with the devil. Oh, how do you prove that? Why do you think Germany killed so many Jews? It was their satanic sacrifice of human flesh to Satan himself. That's what Hitler was behind doing. Not the German people, but what Hitler was. He worshipped the devil, and he was open about it. 
Now look at that. People that make the pact with the devil, the devil's going to make you do evil things. Thank God we don't have to worry about that, right? Amen. Okay. All right. Then he goes on and he says, Therefore, if you will worship before me, and then he says down in verse 9, Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him in the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in all their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And now when the devil had ended every temptation and departed from him until a more opportune time. See, Satan never gives up. You get all, you know, you get all beefed up, all built up, and you'll wait till you get all drained out and then come again. This time have the sword and the door locked. And it says, then Jesus returned and in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went out throughout all the surrounding area. Why did Jesus have to be tempted? Huh? Let's see what you know. Why did devil? Why did Satan? Why did Satan have to tempt Jesus? Why did Jesus have to be tempted? Because Jesus had to be proven. Remember. He is coming, fulfilling the Old Testament and bridging it into the new. So it must be that he fulfills all righteousness, right? So Satan comes to challenge him about him fulfilling what is required to pay the price it is finished for all our unrighteousness. So first challenge was to what? So what are the three temptations of the flesh? The lust of the eyes, the pride of life and the lust of the flesh. These are of the world. These are contrary to God. And they're going to crumble. Amen. Right? So you'll look at every temptation and Satan still uses the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. When he tempts you, he uses one of those three to appeal to us. To appeal to those that are fleshing it out. I'm going to say something. Please listen carefully. The devil can't tempt somebody that has a strong word life. What do you mean? Because they're too fired up for him to get close. He waits till two or three days and when we get to resting on our accomplishments and how good God has been making us. And then we have forgotten to pray already and we haven't searched the word but well, we did it all last week, and we're doing really good. And then the countenance begins to coast, rest, and get dimmer and dimmer. That's why a consistent meeting with God daily keeps us up and tuned and ready at any time to be instant in season and out. Can you say amen? First, uh, first John, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, tells us what I already said, but puts it in John's word. First John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. Remember, good and evil are in it. Not divine good. Good and evil. Okay? Or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lusts of it. But he who does the will of God, a what? Does what? Abides forever. That, say, that's me. That's me. That's you. You see, number one, the, the lust of the flesh is when... When Jesus was hungry, right? How about us? What does the Bible say? How does the enemy know we're in the flesh? I gave you the answers. Come on, let's throw them out again. Countenance. Negative droning speaking. Huh? Actions. Amen. Can you tell the difference between somebody? Let's, let's, let's do, judge ourselves. Can you tell the difference when you are in tune and doing good 
and when you're not so in tune. And how do you feel when you're in tune? You, see, you can be insulted. Somebody could say something weird to you. It doesn't, it's just going to roll off your back. But when you're just a little out of sorts, I mean, just the slightest thing. You ever notice? It can sometimes set you off. Why is that? Because that's where Satan's realm is for temptation. It's in the flesh. So we as Christians, because we know our God loves us and because we have such an open invitation to buddy up with our God at any time, all the time, every time, why do we pass those opportunities just to get a whiff of Satan tempting us? Meet with him on a daily basis. I tell you what, my wife and I discovered this. Our life is so enriched. There's nothing we're doing other than meeting with God. And doing what he asked us to do. Right, dear? It's not hard at all. In fact, it is so simple. And God says, yeah, I'm doing all the work. Yeah, hook up. Follow him. Listen carefully. Ask God to cleanse you if you blow it. Keep on following God. Because one day, the scales will begin to drop off like all kinds of things. And you will see clearly exactly where you were, where you weren't where you need to be, and how to get there. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen. All right, everybody uh, gets tempted. Everyone deals with the tempter. So don't yield. Can you say amen? amen. Temptation will come, but don't yield to it. All right, James chapter 1, verse, verse 12 through 17. Blessed is the man who endures what? You can make a little mark there if you're writing notes, put testing and trials. Blessed is the man who endures testing and trial. For when he has been approved, do you see that? What does that mean? When you put God first in your trial, you're going to go right on through. You'll be approved. Why? Because the flesh will kind of tear away and you, the clean, pure-hearted person that you are, will go through that trial in Christ. And your flesh will sometimes hang up, but it will drop off. Amen. We know that the trying of our faith in many ways are much more precious than that of fire testing gold and that of silver bringing out the dross. So when we face life's hard things, it's our relationship with God and the fire of God in our heart that's bringing our pureness out. Can you say amen? And that we can recognize not to yield to the tempter. So it says, oh, I love it. It's wonderful. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved or tried in the old King James, he will receive a crown of which the Lord has promised to those that love him. Amen. You love him? Yeah. Just hang in there. Don't try to figure things out. That's where we mess up. Why am I going through this? Why, Lord, why? How come, Lord, how come? Poor me, poor me. You see, we do that. We, nah, flesh. All right, so. Let no one say, now everyone say no one. no one. Let no one say, let no one, say it again, let no one say. How many times have you heard them say this though? Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. Why in the New Testament we're not tempted by God? Who could tell me? A couple of reasons. Number one, because God lives in you. So he doesn't need to test you to show you where you're not. He every day shows you where you're not. And it's your denial of it that causes you to get into problems. You go right in with the Lord and say, okay, Lord, deal with this, do this, give me the adjustments now. What faults do I need to really allow you to work on? Tell me what they are, because if I'm in denial about them, I can't ask for help. If you don't know you're actually blowing it in an area, how are you going to know about it? Unless God reveals it to us, 
We certainly don't want the devil to reveal it. <laughs> Can you say amen? All right, so you get the point. All right? Okay, now listen. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For listen to me, don't God keep putting COVID in the earth to test the human beings. God doesn't, okay, listen. God doesn't let, use evil things to test his children. Can anybody tell me why? Because in the New Testament, that would be child abuse. Don't we put people in jail for child abuse? Why do we blame God for putting things on us that he doesn't? Because you haven't been taught right. That's the reason. So we need to find out, Lord, no one say when he's under temptation, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Now what's he saying? BJ, did you see that? God cannot be what? Now we've seen Jesus being tempted and he passed, didn't he? Where does Jesus now as a New Testament believer live? So guess what? The tempter can't tempt the God living in you. But he certainly can tempt your brain and your flesh. And that's the problem with Christians. We walk too much for God in our brain and our flesh and we become easy pickings for Satan's suggestions. Poke your neighbor and say, he's talking to me. I know he is. You bet. That's the way it works, see. Whether we like to embrace that or not. Satan doesn't like any of you because you look like God. Whether you're saved or not. Whether you go to church or not. He's out to kill you. And he will kill and massacre you. So run to Jesus and learn the way in which to be. He's the only one. The only way, truth, and life there is. Many other good suggestions, but... He's the way. Now, let's get this. He says, so don't say when you're under temptation, God's doing this to me. For God who lives in you cannot be tempted by the evil one. Amen. So are you walking by the God inside of you or are you walking by your own understanding? Now you understand that you're tempted if you walk by your own understanding, but if you walk by the God inside of you, that you shall not fulfill the lusts of your flesh. It's simple. It's not a hard thing. How come little children can follow Jesus without complications and us adults seem to run into walls all the time? We have pride and we get our feelings hurt. We do all those silly things, don't we? That's flesh. Great places to be tempted. All right, let's go on. And so let no one say that when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt any man. In the New Testament, why doesn't God tempt us? You need to know the simple answer. BJ, God lives in us now. If you ask Jesus to come into your heart, he's in here. When we went out to mission fields, talking to thousands and thousands of people, the way we knew they were saved or not is by asking them where God is. If they point out, we know they've never experienced being born again of the epiphany of being saved. But if they go, he lives in here, then we know they've asked him to come into their life. Because Jesus says, I stand at the door and, and knock. But you've got to invite me in. I don't come in automatically. Just because your dad was a preacher or your mom was a good Catholic nun. I mean, all those are good things. Doesn't mean because we're born in a family like that, we're automatically grandfathered in. No, even the Jewish people had to confess Jesus as Lord. And they were the ones that first were given the gospel. See, even Mary Magdalene, the mother of Jesus, confessed that Jesus was her Savior. She needed Jesus. You see, so Satan doesn't want us to realize. But he says, but each one, verse 14, listen to this carefully. But each one is tempted. Okay, so evidently tempta the tempter comes, but he can't tempt the God part inside of me that, that God is. But... Every man is tempted hmm, when he is drawn away by his own what? By his own flesh or lust. Hello. Isn't that right? Or his own desires are enticed. Now listen to this next phrase. Okay. Here's what happens. Now moms, dads, Husbands and wives, you know 
When you marry your wife, you consummate that marriage by being intimate. You know, you have to be intimate with the enemy long enough for him to put in you the conception of evil. You want to know how Cain slew his brother Abel? He played with Satan's suggestion so long he became mad. And he killed his brother in the name of religion. Of course, we don't know other people who, in the name of religions kill anybody. <laughs> History repeating itself. Okay, now listen. But it says, then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth separation from God or death. Do not be deceived. There's that word again. Jesus tells his disciples what? Don't be deceived, right? Peter tells his disciples, don't be deceived. Paul tells his disciples, don't be deceived. He even says that when I leave, evil people will come into the church and try to steal people. Don't be deceived. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual things. Don't be deceived. So there's a lot of warnings about that. So we need to recognize it. So, it says, do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift, say good gift. Every perfect gift, everyone say perfect gift, is from above. So, flu, is that from God? Depression. COVID. Joe. <laughs> no, he, Joe's from God. No, you see what I'm saying? So we can actually look at scripture and see that everything that has evil, evil intent, causes corruption, can't be of God. God doesn't use it. God doesn't touch it. Amen. Satan uses it. It's his tools. Yeah. One, when there was a book out some time ago that said Satan is a unwilling participant or participant in God's using him against his children. Okay. I'm serious. People went to Bible college to learn that mess. God doesn't need the devil to teach his children. Amen. Believe me. But they should be in church. They should be reading scripture. They should be praying. Because the Holy Spirit is here to teach us. And the, what does the Bible say about the word? BJ says, and the word says, by the volume of the word that we have in us, God brings us up to perfection. So if you have no understanding of the Bible in you, you're going to bounce around like you don't know anything. Oh, you might have physical knowledge. You might even have knowledge about your trades. But spiritual knowledge, you are a deficit. We need to have that spiritual knowledge. Someone say amen. All right. Winding down with you, you wonderful Christians. How many Christians have you ever heard say, why is God putting me through this? Why has God allowed the sickness to be on my body? Did you know all of that is not God? That's just misunderstanding. I know people that prayed and prayed and prayed. They never got healed and they end up dying. Graduation day. Amen. Because we don't understand because this life is really hell even when you're living a pretty good one. One day in heaven, one bad day in heaven is better than the best day on earth. And nobody has a bad day in heaven. So the idea is we got these concepts of religion and understanding, and then we try to run our life on bad concepts. It's kind of like running your car on diesel when it runs gas. And that's what's wrong. So let's find out how God wants us to do it. Right, BJ? Yeah. Amen. All right. So let's go. God never uses evil or anything to draw us away from himself. A double-minded God is unstable in all his ways. Why would God ask you to do something just to get in the way of you doing it? Come on now. So we know God's perfect in all his ways. Right. Two, God, God does prove us, but he proves us in this area. He proves to us all our bragging is we're not all that we should be. 
One thing God proves to us is we can't save ourselves, right? Right? I mean, we're good. You're good, wonderful people. But being a good, wonderful person does not make you saved. Okay. Thirdly, the enemy does not know at times where we are at. So he throws temptations and suggestions hoping you're going to bite. Oh, Pastor Linda doesn't love you anymore. <laughs> that minister's just crabby. You couldn't sit under him. You see, that's how the enemy works. Sets us all up. I can even pick them out of the air with people. I can actually tell you what the enemy's been telling most of you all week long. How can you do that, Pastor Gary? Because of the Holy Spirit. I can't become an accurate teacher if I don't know your mail. I don't want your dirty underwear, but I do will. God will give me what you need. Can you say amen? And if you don't understand it, you need to understand why there are apostles, prophets, pa evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping and perfecting of the believers. So guess what? I didn't volunteer for this job, but I certainly was trained well. So, and I didn't do it on my own. And my grandma didn't send me to Bible college. So let's go on. Fourthly, temptation will come. Are you ready for it? So how do we know when temptation might come? When we're weak. The enemy picks us off when we're negative, when we talk. When our words drone. When our countenance looks dull. We got a frown on our face. Walking around, you know. He goes, ah, easy pickings today. Amen. So, you know, that's pretty basic, okay. So, what should we do, Pastor Kerry? Number one, recognize when you're being tempted. Yes. Remember, Satan divides us, not unites us. So if something is spoken to you or you got an idea or a suggestion and it's dividing you up, making you doubt about people and doubt this, you know it doesn't come from God because it's not perfect. So guess what? Just because the birds fly over your, your head, don't let them poop on your head. Can you say amen? Second of all, the Bible says, Draw nigh to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee, right? So when a tempt temptation comes, just say no. No, in Jesus' name. Don't make a big deal out of it and go on. Walk away. Thirdly, flood your mind with the word and good thoughts, praises, so your head doesn't have any empty space to be filled with any negativity, right? Everybody do this with me. This is fun. I'm going to ask you to count slowly in your mind, one to ten. And then I'm going to interrupt you while you're quietly thinking one to ten and have you talk, speak out loud your name. When I say, say your name, I'll do it right when you're thinking one, two, and I'll say, say your name, and speak out loud your name. Then find out what happens to your thoughts when you do. All right, you ready? Let's count to ten real slow. Go ahead. Say your name. Out loud. Say your name out loud. When you say your name out loud, your brain stops. Don't think your name. I never said anything about thinking. I said, think one to ten. Now say your name out loud. What happened? So when you're having bad thoughts, maybe your mind's racing at night. Satan has showed you a whole bunch of things that you should have done. You lied about. Maybe you didn't do something right. And your mind's racing. Just start thanking the Lord. Your mind will shut down and start listening to what you're saying and say it long enough for it to rest and then go to sleep. But what happens is we'll say a couple of words, praise you, praise you, and then we'll stop and our mind picks up again. No, no. Learn how to fight right. All right. Then fifthly, excuse me, fourthly, count it all joy when you're tempted. Why? Because you're being worthy. Satan doesn't tempt somebody who doesn't do anything. And fifthly, finally remember, 
It's not about you. You never get your feelings hurt if you don't have you on your mind. Hello? Do you know, one of the problems I had when I was a younger man is I didn't know the difference between my performance and my character. See, God loves me, but sometimes he wants my performance to be better. Hello? Do you know what I mean? Job reviews, on the job reviews, being where you are, right? We need to have job reviews daily with God. How am I doing, Lord? And there was a space in heaven for about a half an hour. <laughs> See, we need to evaluate ourselves so others don't evaluate us. I have people evaluating me all the time, but they never bother to ask me about it. <laughs> all right, Luke 8, 11 through 14 says this. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God and those by the wayside are the ones that hear but the devil comes immediately and takes away the word that's sown in their hearts lest at any time they should hear it and believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are the ones who when they hear they receive the word with joy. And these are the ones that have no root in themselves, no desire, but believe for a while that in a time of temptation, they give up. Hello? The devil tell you you're no good, nobody loves you there at that church, so you give up, and it probably was the right one you should have been at. Hello? Luke 22, 39 through 46, I'm just going to read a part of it where it says about temptation. Come, it says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, and he was, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And he came to the place where he said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Remember in the garden? He prayed, Lord, take this cup from me. He did it three times, didn't he? And each time when he came back, he checked on his disciples. What were they doing? Sleeping! Now listen, you wonder why preachers don't like sleepers? <laughs> they do. That's no big deal. Here's, here's Jesus' disciples. He's about ready to get betrayed. And they're asleep, the little buggers. How dare they think they're that together? And when Jesus was taken captive, they were so surprised. Weren't they? That they all ran away from him. There wasn't anybody that hung out with Jesus. They all betrayed him at one point. So we know what the devil is trying to do with temptation. So if you feel thoughts saying, you can't go to that church, they don't love you. Is that coming from God? No. Okay. If, if all of a sudden you get little symptoms in your body and your, your head says, oh no, you're coming down with something. Maybe you got COVID. Do you think that's from God, that suggestion? Do you know what to do about things like that? Great. Most people don't. And, and Christians, about 80% about of them, they're just there, but they don't know what they should do, when they should do things. And so that's why the Bible tells us to be trained exercise, right? Amen. So tonight, who's our tempter? Amen. Never say God's tempting you. Why? Because he doesn't tempt you. Right. Why doesn't he tempt you? Because he knows everything. Who tempts you? Satan does, right? And the purpose of his temptation is to locate you and to cause you to stumble and to give up. Well, tonight we give you glory, Father. Thank you. And take these words and let them roll over us over and over and over again. Let us not find offense to the gospel or those that share it, but let us embrace your love, Father. Teach us more about caring and walking in your grace. In Jesus' name, we all said.